encryption uh, session. The, the first talk is uh, efficient FHEs bootstrapping with small evaluation keys and applications to, to threshold homomorphic encryption by Yung Wu Lee, Daniel Emishansu, Andrew Kim, Rak Yung Choi, Maxim Deryabin, Jion Hon, and Dong Yun Yu. And Yung Wu Yung will, do, will, do, will uh, give the talk. Okay, so, um, well, thank you for the introduction. And um, this is a great pleasure and pressure uh, to be speaking at Eurocrypt, the first talk in the first session on the first day, track number one. <laughs> but um, let me try my best. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about our paper entitled F Efficient FHW Bootstrapping with Small Evaluation Keys and Application to Threshold Home Encryption. This is a joint work with Vishan Shio, Kim, Che, Deryabin, Om, um, you, and myself. Uh, here's the outline, and um, after a brief preliminaries, I will tell you about uh, our new blind rotation technique, and then the analysis and implementation will be given. After that, we will see how to design the efficient FHW-like threshold home encryption using our bootstrapping. Preliminaries. Uh, Dukai Misanshio first proposed the FHW scheme, and after that, there has been a series of work improving it and using the beautiful idea inside. Uh, FHW-like schemes are the best-known bit-level home of encryption. It has small parameter size, and its bootstrapping is super fast. There are two competing approaches bootstrapping it. First one is called AP, or also known as FHW or DM. It supports arbitrary secrets, but uh, it has large bootstrapping key size. And the other one is Jinx, uh, named after Gamma et al., also known as TFHG or CGJ approach. And um, it supports uh, limited security distribution, but it has, has small bootstrapping key size and uh, quite efficient. In this talk, we propose the third bootstrapping, offering the best of both AP and Jinx, means that our technique naturally supports arbitrary secrets and it has small bootstrapping key size at the same time. Uh, as an additional benefit, it has smaller noise growth, and uh, we can design efficient uh, FHW like threshold home encryption because it supports arbitrary secret and it has simple key structure. And the source code is also available at OpenFHG. Uh, this is a brief sketch of FHW bootstrapping. In FHW, the input is out of the ciphertext. And to perform a binary gate using those two input out of the inputs, we first add them up, and, and, and then the decryption on the added ciphertext is performed inside on RW ciphertext, and the decryption is done in the exponent here. And then we extract uh, one value uh, encrypted in RW, and to fit the parameters, we do some mode switching and key switchings. Here's the definition of blind notation. Uh, the input of line notation is f and on LW ciphertext. The output is RW of f times x to the this green thing, beta plus alpha s. Uh, this is a decryption of LW input ciphertext, and um, this is the core part of FHW-like bootstrapping. And I'd like to note that the constant term of this f times something is f minus u, and where u is the decrypted value of LW. We actually doing rotation. We are actually rotating the coefficient of f without the knowledge of u, so we call it blind rotation. Uh, usage of blind rotation is not just limited to the bootstrapping of FHW-like home encryption. Uh, it is widely used in area of home encryption for um, non-arithmetic operations. For example, we can use it for some machine learning algorithms or um, accurate sign function can be performed using blind rotation. And then a totally new approach of bootstrapping CKKS, BGB, BFB has been proposed using blind rotation too. We use RGSW encryption as a building block of blind rotation. Uh, as you can see in this equation, when M2 is small, the error E1 is not multiplied. And uh, let's see that uh, multiplying monomial x to the k is equal to adding k in the exponent. So we use it to add uh, a partial information of secret key to the exponent again and again. But as we only have addition in the exponent, 
uh, we need some workarounds. For example, in AP, we decompose alpha i, and we need many RGSW key for all the possible decomposition of alphas. In Jinx, uh, we decompose SI instead, and we can control the distribution of SI for um, efficient algorithm design, but the distribution of SI is somehow limited. We propose another blind rotation algorithm without such workaround by introducing another building block, ring automorphism. Uh, we use ring automorphism to perform constant multiplication on the exponent. Uh, here's the definition of evaluator T. Uh, it takes two inputs MRW of M and an automorphism key AK. And the results should be RWZ of MX to the T, and it involves one key switching. Let's see how it use. Uh, we are given an initial ciphertext of RWF prime something, and then we can add SI to the exponent by performing RGSW multiplication. And then we do the eval auto by alpha i. We can multiply alpha i to the exponent. And by taking some proper f prime, we have f times x to the r pi si. By repeating this process, we can perform the decryption of LWC hypertext in the exponent, which is blind notation, right? So here's the toy example. Alpha is given as 525, 5m1. Five uh, we have some initial ciphertext at prime, and then we multiply x to the si, and then we perform eval auto by five. And then we add s0 and s2 again using rgsw, and then we multiply five again. And then we can see that s0 and s2 is multiplied by five, and s1 is multiplied by 25. And finally, we can add s3, and the inner product is done in the exponent and we can perform x to the beta, and the decryption is done. Uh, in this toy example, uh, we can see that we used RGSW of x to the si to add si in the exponent, and we uh, did eval auto for uh, constant multiplication. <coughs> Things to note is that we only need one automorphism key, ak5, because 1, 5, and 25 are all powers of 5. We can actually extend it to the full orientation. It is well known that 5 and minus 1 generates uh, G2 and star. Uh, we don't have to use 5 and minus 1. We can use other generator anyway. So we only need automorphism key for uh, AKG and AK minus 1. So we need constant number of automorphism keys only. And the total computation will be N multiplication of RGSW and uh, at most N evil autos. So um, let me explain the core algorithm. Uh, we define a set of indices, i sub l plus, as the set of indexes um, where alpha i is g to the l. And we define i sub l minus similarly. Those are set of indexes. And then using the fact that g has um, degree n over 2, we can decompose the inner product of alpha and s as given here. Uh, you can see that in the equation uh, right-hand side, there is only addition and constant g and minus 1. No other constant appears in this equation. So we can perform it using um, automorphism by g and minus 1 only. So for a given accumul uh, ciphertext, initial ciphertext, we can add um, all the sj's, uh, j in i sub n over 2 minus 1, and then we multiply g by eval auto g, and then we again multiply um, j's in i sub n minus 1, I'm n over 2 minus 2, and then we multiply g again. By repeating this process, we, we, are, we are doing the decryption. So you can find the full algorithm in the paper. Uh, as you might catch, uh, there is a limitation. The automorphism exists only for odd numbers. So alpha i should be odd, but it's not, because it's a ciphertext that distributes it randomly. So we propose several variants, but um, let me explain just one of it that uh, we call round to old. Recalling the FHW bootstrapping, at the end we perform mode switching. Mode switching is just rescaling the ciphertext and performing some rounding operation. Instead of normal rounding, we do round to old, where round to old finds the nearest old integer. By doing this process, alpha i and beta, beta doesn't have to be old, but anyway, alpha will be all old element. 
And there is another optimization using uh, multiple automorphism keys. Uh, assume that I sub L is empty. It actually happens uh, very often in rare cases. And in this case, once we add all the SJs in J in I sub L plus one, we perform Eva auto, and we have to multiply um, J's uh, X to the SJ, where J is in I sub L. But there is nothing, so we have nothing to do, and we perform two consecutive automorphisms by G. Instead, if we have automorphism by G square, we can reduce it into one automorphism by G square. Uh, here is a graph of uh, performance uh, following to number of automorphism keys, and we can see that by using small constant number like six or 10, uh, it outperforms existing algorithms. It is even fa faster than binary genes. Uh, here's the analysis and implementation. Here's a brief analysis about key and number of multiplication for bootstrapping and the error growth normalized. And you can see that uh, the best uh, of previous approach is binary genes, where u is equal to one. And we can see the dominate term and number of keys are similar here, and the number of multiplication is also similar, but we have smaller error growth. And I think this slide is the most interesting part in this talk, uh, that we actually improved efficiency using Gaussian secrets. In home encryption, uh, it is very usual to use small keys for efficiency, even though it has weaker um, backgrounds for security. Uh, for example, in, in Jinx, uh, we use binary key, and in CKKS, we even use sparse secret for better bootstrapping or uh, small error growth. But by using Gaussian secret here, we can reduce the degree of out of read ciphertext from 517 to 450, which directly affects its performance. And we tried our best to find a new parameter for each scheme uh, with the, uh, with the uh, newest version of LW estimator, uh, lattice estimator. And then you can see that we achieved the runtime and key size the fastest. So here is how to design FHW like threshold home encryption scheme. Threshold home encryption scheme is a more compelling motivation to use larger secrets. Uh, in threshold home encryption, the secret key is distributed among uh, participants, and the decryption is done collaboratively. So let's say J is the set of um, participants, and each of them generates SJ and ZJ their own secret key. This can be small, but the common secret key should be the sum of um, SJs and ZJ. And so as it is the summation of it, we cannot make G star or S star small. So we need the uh, uh, bootstrapping for larger secrets. We can uh, make public key even though nobody knows the G star or S star by using common reference string. And um, by generating BJ by party J, uh, summing up the BJ will give us the public key. As we have public key, each party can uh, make an encryption of the, uh, any value they want. So um, uh, party J generates RWE prime of GJX to the K, and then it is sent to the computing party, and the computing party sum up the key. And then it will be RWE prime key of G star of, uh, under secret key G star, and the message is G star X to the K, which can be used as automorphism uh, by K. And then we also need RGSW key. And um, the difference here uh, from the previous slide is that the addition of SJI should be done in the exponent. So we need to use RGSW multiplication, not the addition. We have to use the product of ciphertext. So party J generates the encryption um, RGSW X to the SJI, and it is sent to the computing party, and the computing party finds the product of the keys and it will be x to the s star i. So now we have all keys required for our bootstrapping. So we have um, x to the s i rgsw key, and we have automorphism key for g and minus one. So we can make a few like threshold home encryption. Conclusion, we proposed a new blind rotation technique, uh, which offers the best of AP and Jinx. And um, we provided several variants in the paper. And due to its uh, simple key structure and um, 
as it provides the larger secrets, we can design threshold home of encryption using uh, based on FHW. It would be very interesting to apply our scheme to other structures like Entrue or Torus variants known as Finer and KFHG. And I think it is also very important future work uh, improving the batch bootstrapping using our technique. Uh, those are references. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So, uh, any questions? So, uh, I have one question. Uh, have you tried to, to use your technique to your improve bootstrapping for the CKKS uh, scheme for the bootstrapping of the modular reduction? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, for the um, classical, uh, the question was if we can improve the CKKS bootstrapping using this technique. And um, for the usual uh, classical CKKS bootstrapping, we do not use blind notation for it. But there is a method uh, performing CKKS bootstrapping uh, with blind notation. For that, maybe we can apply this. But um, so far, the classical CKKS bootstrapping is way efficient than using blind notation. So maybe it's not a good idea, but we can do it. Okay, thank you. No questions? So let's thank the, the speaker again. So the next tool is on polynomial functions, modulo P2E, and faster bootstrapping to for homomorphic encryption by Robin Gillen, Ilya Ilyashenko, Jackie Aikan, and Frederic Ferkotoran. And Robin will give the talk. Thank you for the introduction. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin Gillen, and I will present our work on polynomial functions, modulo p to the e, uh, and its application to faster bootstrapping for homomorphic encryption. So this is uh, indeed a joint work with Ilya, Jai, and uh, Fre. So fully homomorphic encryption, as in the previous talk, is a crypto system that allows us to compute certain operations over the ciphertext space. Given an encryption of a number A and a number B, we can compute uh, an encryption of their sum and their product. For the BGV and the BFE scheme, which are the two schemes considered here, these operations are computed over the integers mod P to the E, where we will assume that P is a prime number and E is a positive integer. So basically, we will uh, be working modulo a power of a prime number. More complicated functions than, just, than this are typically evaluated by writing them as a polynomial. All FHE schemes that we have today uh, are based on lattice cryptography, which means that ciphertexts are noisy. This noise will grow with the homomorphic operations that we apply. Um, so you can see on the slide that the noise of the output ciphertext, shown in yellow, will be larger than the noise of the input ciphertext. Fortunately, there exists this operation that can reduce the noise, and this is what we call bootstrapping. For the BGV and the BFE scheme, bootstrapping consists of two main components, which are called the linear transformations and the digit removal procedure. However, for practical parameter sets, the digit removal procedure can be 3 to 50 times more expensive than the linear transformations, and is therefore the true bottleneck. So if we want to improve bootstrapping, we should really focus on this digit removal step. And internally, digit removal also consists of a series of polynomial evaluations. So yeah, we can see that it is quite important to have a thorough understanding of the properties of these, poly fun these polynomial functions. Now I will introduce some of the required terminology. We say that a function from the integers mod p to the e to itself is a polynomial function, or polyfunction for short, if it can be expressed as a polynomial with integer coefficients. We call the polynomial itself a representation of the function. And during this talk, we will always follow the convention of writing a function with lowercase letters and a polynomial with the corresponding uppercase letter. In the special case that E is equal to 1, 
then we are actually working over a field. And it is possible to show that every function is a polyfunction. Moreover, the uh, lowest degree representation will be unique and can simply be obtained via the interpolation method. However, if E is greater than one, then we are not working over a field and the inverse properties are, are uh, true. Now the second case, E is greater than one, is mathematically the most interesting one and also what we will focus on uh, for the rest of the talk. Therefore, the first objective of our work is to perform a systematic study of these polyfunctions, and especially in the non-trivial case where E is greater than one. We will try to answer questions such as, how can we determine whether a given function is a polyfunction? Given a polyfunction, how can we obtain a representation of it? Uh, and also how to find FHE-friendly representations. With this we mean less noise growth and uh, fewer scalar and non-scalar multiplications to evaluate it. A second objective is then uh, showing how to accelerate bootstrapping for the BGV and the BFV scheme. Okay, so the digit removal procedure inside bootstrapping is built from a very simple function, which we will call the digit extraction function, and we will write it as G subscript E for this presentation. Digit extraction takes as input an e-digit number, as shown by the colored squares on the slide. Uh, and also the output is an e-digit number, where the least significant digit is the same as the input, and all other digits are equal to zero. So it's really uh, extracting the least significant digit. It has already been shown previously that digit extraction is a polyfunction, and there exist ad hoc, ad hoc methods to obtain representations. For example, for p is equal to 2 and e is equal to 8, Alevi and Schub perform repeated squaring and find a very simple representation of degree 2 to the 7. Later, uh, Chen and Han optimized the polynomial of Halevi and Schub and find a degree 8 polynomial. Now, how is it possible that two different polynomials evaluate the same function? Well, this can only be true if the difference between these two polynomials evaluates to zero in every point. Such a polynomial is what we call a null polynomial. In other words, we say that a polynomial O of x is a null polynomial if it evaluates the zero function mod p to the e. Then, the main observation from our work is that if we start from any representation of digit extraction, for example, a Levi Shoup or Chen Han, and if we add such a null polynomial, then we are basically changing the polynomial itself without changing the function that we evaluate. In other words, we can obtain equivalent representations of the same function by adding such a null polynomial. This will allow us to select from these equivalent representations an FHE-friendly one instead of just a random one. Now, an interesting question which I will address next is how can we find these null polynomials? And it turns out that, again, for E is equal to 1, this is a bit simple. In that case, we can just follow Fermat's little theorem, which states that uh, x to the p minus x and all of its multiples are null polynomials. It is a bit more complicated for E is greater than 1. In that case, we need to define the so-called falling factorial polynomials, which are basically just products of successive linear factors. And we observe that evaluating such a polynomial at any integer will give us a result which is divisible by I factorial. Therefore, if I factorial is divisible by P to the E, then our polynomial will uh, already be a null polynomial automatically. On the other hand, if this is not the case, if I factorial is not divisible by P to the E, then we need to multiply our polynomial by an appropriate power of P, and only then we will obtain a null polynomial. And it has already been proven in mathematical works that uh, all null polynomials are, in fact, linear combinations of these two options. Now I will say something about the lowest degree representation for polyfunctions. And for this slide, let uh, O of x be a monic null polynomial of the lowest degree. Then what we can do 
starting from any representation, GE, of digit extraction. Uh, we can apply Euclidean division by this monic null polynomial. This will give us some remainder, GE prime, which is guaranteed to represent the same function as GE, so also the digit extraction function. However, our remainder will always have a degree which is less than P times E. Therefore, P times E is really an upper bound on the degree of the polynomials which we should expect. Going back to the Chen Han representation, uh, well, it turns out that their polynomial already has minimal degree. However, this is not yet the end of the story, since we can still search for even better representations in terms of scalar and non-scalar multiplications. Our first improvement observes that digit extraction is in fact a symmetric function, namely an even function when p is 2 and an odd function when p is greater than 2. This allows us to choose a representation with either only even or odd exponent terms. For example, in the case p is greater than 2, we can evaluate the very simple formula from the slide, which will cancel out the even exponent terms. The case p is equal to 2 is a bit more complicated, since we cannot directly divide by 2 in that case, and we simply refer to the paper for more details. Compared to Chen and Han, we save a factor of square root 2 in non-scalar multiplications and a factor of 2 in scalar multiplications. Our second improvement is based on a lattice structure. Here the idea is to interpret polynomials as coefficient factors, and in doing so, we observe that the set of all null polynomials of a certain degree bound actually forms a lattice. This is visualized on the slide for a two-dimensional lattice formed by the black dots. So each of these black dots is a null polynomial. Then again, starting from any representation, GE of the digit extraction function, we can solve the closest factor problem on this lattice. This will give us the closest null polynomial. And we observe that if we compute the difference between GE and its closest null polynomial, then we will obtain an equivalent representation, but with significantly smaller coefficients. Coming back to our example, so we already know that Chen and Han find a degree 8 polynomial. Applying our first and second improvement to their polynomial also gives us a degree 8 representation. However, our polynomial has uh, much smaller coefficients and also only even uh, exponent terms. And this will allow for a more efficient evaluation with less noise. Our third improvement is a function composition approach and it works especially well for larger values of E. Here the idea is to decompose digit extraction into two steps. In the first step we pick some parameter E prime which is less than E and you will already compute digit extraction with parameter E prime. After this first step, as you can see, the result will already be correct in the E prime least significant digits, but the upper digits will still contain garbage. Then in the second step, we will evaluate another function to also remove the upper digits. Now the main observation here uh, from the slide is that the relevant domain of the second step is only equal to the range of the first step. But this range of the first step is going to be a very small subset of the integers mod p to the e. And this insight will allow us to alleviate the definition of null polynomials in the sense that we now only require that our null polynomials evaluate to zero over this restricted range. And this will give us many more null polynomials than in the general case. These extra null polynomials can then be exploited to optimize the digit extraction function even further, simply by repeating all previous tricks. Compared to Chen and Han, we bring down the number of non-scalar multiplications from square root e to fourth root of e, and the number of scalar multiplications from e to square root e. However, this also comes uh, at an extra cost, and the total degree of digit extraction will increase with roughly a factor of p. So you can really see it as a trade-off between execution time and total polynomial degree. I will give another example. Assume that we want to compute 
digit extraction mod 2 to the 25. In the first step, we could already compute the, the result mod 2 to the 8 using the polynomial we already found earlier. Then in the second step, we can start from the result of the first step and evaluate another polynomial to complete the computation. Note that our second polynomial has very small degree, only equal to 5, and very small coefficients compared to 2 to the 25. Having discussed all optimizations for digit extraction, let's go to the digit removal procedure. Also here we start from an e-digit number, and this time our goal is to remove the v least significant ones. And this is done by extracting these v least significant digits all separately using the digit extraction function. However, besides from extracting these v least significant digits, we also need to compute the same digits with a lower value of the precision, as shown at the bottom of the slide. Now, in theory, you can just substitute these numbers at the bottom by the one at the top, but in practice, this is not so clever because the ones at the bottom can be computed with lower degree polynomials. Our approach for dealing with this problem differs from the previous ones in three aspects. First of all, we only use our optimized polynomials. Secondly, we try to reuse polynomial evaluations as much as possible without increasing the degree of the Chen Han version. Thirdly, uh, we evaluate multiple polynomials simultaneously in the same point using the baby step giant step technique. To show the benefits of our method, we have implemented it in the HE lab library. This slide shows some experimental results. Um, so as you can see, the speed up depends a bit on the parameter set, but in general, we were able to achieve a decent speed up of one and a half up to two and a half times. For example, in the first column where we consider plain text space a power of two, we bring down the total execution time from more than 2,000 seconds to less than 900 seconds. We have also implemented our function composition approach and tested it for some higher values of E. For example, E is 59 and E is 37 in the slide. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, um, by applying function composition, we can even get a much larger speed up uh, for these parameter sets. For example, 2.8 times versus 1.8 times. So the left number here is the speed up without function composition. The right number is with function composition. In conclusion, we can speed up bootstrapping for the BGV and the BFE scheme up to 2.6 times. This is only possible due to a better understanding of polyfunctions mod P to the E, and in particular due to the existence of non-trivial node polynomials. And we believe that this theory of polyfunctions can also be of independent interest in cryptography, and we are looking forward to see more applications. I thank you for your attention. Any questions? No, no questions. So I, I have a, a small question. Can, can you apply your uh, decomposition function uh, recursively? To uh, yeah, that's also possible. However, in practice, we observe that it only still gives speed up if we apply it one time. But it is possible in theory. Uh, yeah, but for practical parameter sets, it will not give you any more speed up. Okay. No questions? So let's find the, the speaker again. The last talk of the session is functional commitments to, for all functions with transparent setup and from SIS from Leo de Castro and Chris Spikert. And Leo will give the talk. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, this talk is on functional, functional commitments for all functions from SIS with transparent setup. Joint work with Chris Spikert. So, just as a brief preview, 
Uh, in this talk, we're going to be building functional commitments for all functions. Uh, our only assumption will be SIS. Uh, we'll have transparent setup. Uh, our public parameters will just be a single random matrix. Uh, and we're going to get fast and simple verification. Uh, to verify an opening of this uh, commitment scheme, the verifier will just need to check one linear relation. Uh, so this talk is going to be split up into two parts. Uh, the first, we're going to uh, go over the functional commitment uh, construction and a brief sketch of the security proof. And then in this, the second part, we're going to talk about how to use this con construction, um, how to take advantage of some of the more attractive features, uh, and really how you can uh, efficiently specialize this construction uh, to some of the more uh, common special cases. OK, so let's jump right in. Uh, what is a functional commitment? Uh, so we start with a function family, capital F. And then there's a setup algorithm that uh, outputs public parameters that both the prover and the verifier have. The prover then picks some function in this family and commits to this, commits to this function um, with some commitment algorithm. And we're not really going to be worried about hiding at all in this talk. And so in order to get binding uh, without just having a trivial uh, construction, we're going to be having some uh, e efficiency re re requirements on the uh, commitment. In, in, in particular, the um, length of the commitment will have to be uh, less than the length of the function. It's also worth, worth noting that um, other works consider committing to inputs and opening to functions. Uh, in, in this work, we'll be really uh, committing to functions and opening to inputs. Uh, these notions are equivalent uh, using universal cir circuits, but uh, this is just a useful um, conceptual model. OK, so the prover sends the commitment over to the verifier. The verifier picks some input x to this function. Uh, the prover then runs f on x to get y, and then produces some opening proof that this evaluation was performed correctly. Uh, um, again, uh, we need the proof to be uh, less than the size of the function. Uh, and so the verifier then gets the claimed output, and the, the proof runs the, the verify algorithm um, to either accept or reject this proof. Uh, so because uh, we have this efficiency re requirement of the verifier really not getting this function, um, we need to think a little bit about what the uh, security property is that makes the most sense here. Uh, we really want to say that the prover has committed to some function. And what that is going to mean a little bit more formally is that for every, in for every uh, input x, there's only going to be one y and uh, proof that the prover can uh, provide that will pass uh, verification. So with this motivation, uh, let's give a brief definition of the security. Uh, the following game should be hard to win. We're going to be focused on the uh, selective version of this game, but the uh, adaptive version can be achieved via uh, complexity leveraging. Uh, right, so because it's the selective version, the adversary is going to give us the x star that it's going to break uh, the evaluation binding on. And then we're going to run the setup algorithm to get the public parameters. These public parameters will be fed back into the adversary, who will pr produce some commitment, and then two openings uh, corresponding to two claimed outputs, y1 and y2. And the adversary wins this game if uh, y1 and y2 are not equal, but the verification passes for both openings. So this means that the adversary has successfully equivocated on uh, the input x star. OK, so what are some applications of functional commitments? Uh, you can see functional commitments as a generalization of many very useful special cases, like vector commitments, polynomial commitments, uh, et cetera. And because they have so many useful specializations, uh, they have lots and lots of applications. Way too many to go over here. But I uh, just want to highlight the second to the bottom one, um, which is proof carrying data snarks and snarks. Uh, we really see this primitive as a nice floating block to building more e efficient lattice-based snarks. OK. So what was known about functional commitments before this, before this work? Well, if, um, if you are fine with non-falsifiable non -falsifiable assumptions, uh, you can build functional commitments somewhat generically from a short commitment and a snarg for NP, where the snarg witness is uh, the opening of the, sh the short commitment to some function that evaluates to the claimed output on the, on the chosen input. But if I'm, if I'm only happy with falsifiable assumptions, um, then all prior constructions were limited to linearizable functions. Um, things like uh, vectors and polynomials, things that can be easily uh, expressed as linear operations. Uh, in 2021, uh, Pikert, Pepin, and Sharp um, constructed functional commitments for all functions, but they required this online authority that releases like opening keys for all uh, open in inputs, which is not, not a very natural uh, security model. 
And so the open problem from this work is, okay, can we con construct functional commitments for all functions without any online authority? And this is the, re the result of this work. So as I said, our only assumption is SIS, which gives us post-quantum security. We have a transparent setup, so our public parameters are just a single random matrix. Uh, we have linear verification. Uh, the verifier only ever checks a single linear relation to verify an opening. Uh, we get more features that I'll talk about a little bit later, and uh, also mention how we can efficiently specialize. Uh, before I move on, though, I want to briefly mention uh, two con concurrent works. The first is this work of uh, Labas et al. Uh, on chainable functional commitments, and the second is uh, the work of Wee and Wu that we'll hear about on Thursday. All, all of these works uh, con construct functional commitments for all functions based off of lattice assumptions, but uh, note that uh, our work is the only of these three that uh, uses a standard assumption. Both of these other works introduce new, uh, new assumptions in their, in their work um, to, to build their Primitive. Uh, we're also the only of these three works that has transparent setup. The other two works, there's private randomness in, this, in the setup algorithm that uh, can't be known by the, by the prover. Um, the succinctness here, when I say, uh, you know, we all a, a, achieve uh, succinct commitments, this is much more strict than the succinctness in the, in the previous slide. This is really like poly, polylog. Uh, it's a succinctness, so we all get uh, these short commitments, but uh, our openings are not as short as the other, these, these other two works. In particular, our openings will be linear in the length of the input and the length of the output. Um, however, we are the only of these, we are the only one of these works to achieve fast ver verification. In these other two works, the verifier essentially has to run the function in order to verify the opening. Uh, and if you think about an application like verifiable FH, FHE, if I'm forcing the verifier to run the, the, the whole function just to verify the output, uh, the outsourcing doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So it's a really nice open question in this, in this work to um, maintain uh, fast verification while getting uh, succinct openings still. Okay, so let's move on into the construction. Brief background on the SIS pr problem. Uh, the SAS problem says, given a uniformly random matrix A, uh, find some short vector X such that A times X equals E, where E is also short. This might be uh, slightly different than what you've seen, where like A times X equals zero, but actually this is the same problem. And just the way that you should think about uh, parameters, just as a brief, brief intuition, is that A is a very wide matrix. Uh, the, the number of columns is way bigger than the number of rows. And that the norm bound uh, on our X and our E is like roughly within a factor of N of the modulus. So really, really quite, quite close to the modulus. Uh, so our, our main technical tool to build this, these, functional, these functional commitments is a homomorphic compu computation scheme. Uh, this, if you were wondering why this talk was in this session. Um, so I'm gonna briefly uh, describe this. Um, so we're gonna fix some matrix C and we're gonna let F be any, any function, think of F as an arithmetic circuit, and let X be some input to F. And the key e equation that we're gonna be staring at for the rest of this talk is uh, C minus encode of X, where you think of encode as just like a, a matrix Im embedding of, of X. In encode will also need to be an, an additive hom homomorphism, but um, I'll refer you to the details for more uh, uh, re sorry, re refer you to the paper for more details on this. Um, the details of in encode aren't really necessary to get this scheme from a high level. Uh, so we have C minus encode of X times some, some S uh, equals uh, C sub F minus in encode of F of X. And um, we really need two, two properties here. Uh, the first, that C sub F is efficiently computable and that it depends only on C and F. So once I fix C and F, C sub F is the same for all X. And secondly, we need C, S sub uh, F and X to be short and also e efficiently uh, uh, computable. Um, you know, the, if you've seen any of these works that I've listed at the top, this equation probably looks quite familiar. Um, but I just want to emphasize that there's actually no randomness here. Once you fix C, everything is a, determ is a deterministic function of uh, C, F, and sometimes X, as opposed to these other works that, you know, so, so sometimes there's randomness in the sampling of S, sometimes the whole thing is wrapped in a secret, but this is kind of a much uh, simpler um, conceptual view of this very useful type of equation. Okay, so once we have this equation in place, the construction just kind of follows via pattern, pattern matching. Uh, our uh, setup algorithm is just the matrix C. This is our transparent setup. Uh, uniformly random, we need no, no structure from C, so uh, this is 
yeah, this is our setup algorithm. Uh, the commit algorithm is just uh, C sub f. It depends only on C and f, so uh, this is a natural choice for the commitment. The opening is uh, S sub f and x. Again, it's efficiently computable from all of the inputs to open. And finally, ver verify just checks that the proof is short and that uh, the equation at the top is true. OK, so what does the security proof look like? Uh, just as a, as a brief sketch, we're going to start with an SIS challenge C, uniformly random matrix. Uh, the adversary is going to tell us what input it's going to break. And we're going to set our public parameters to be uh, C prime, which is the SAS challenge shifted by the encoding of X star in the other direction, as in the verification e, e equation. So now, when the adversary uh, produces the commitment and the two openings, uh, when we shift the, um, the, the public parameters by the chosen input, we're going to get our, our SAS challenge back. And because, uh, the, um, because the two proofs are short and uh, the left-hand sides are now, or sorry, the right-hand sides are now different, we can sub subtract uh, the two left-hand sides to cancel out whatever commitment the adversary gave us. And as long as some column of encode is short, then we're, then we're done. I'll refer you to the paper for more details, but this is really the uh, high-level view of the security proof. OK, so that con concludes part one. Now let's talk a little bit about features and how to efficiently specialize this construction. OK, so let's uh, talk about stateless updates. I'm going to focus on the linear case first because it's a lot simpler, but also uh, really quite, quite a useful special case. Um, so our goal here is going to be to update a commitment to f to a commitment to f plus g. And uh, I'm going to generate my commitment to G as I would without even thinking about F. And the observation here is that because the uh, verification equation is linear and encode is an additive homomorphism, uh, the, uh, the verification e equation just uh, still, still passes if I just add my commitment to G to my commitment to F and if I add my, my opening to uh, G at X to my opening to F at X. At x. So really, if I want to update f, I don't even need, need to know, not only do I need, not need, need to know anything about f, I don't even need to know anything about the commitment to, to f. So this is really quite, quite nice that uh, the verifier can update the uh, commitments totally locally. Uh, if I want arbitrary composition, um, where you know, my goal now is to update proofs, uh, sorry, co um, co commitments and proofs to f to ones for g com composed with, with f, uh, I'm going to, you know, let the, the, the prover know uh, C, C sub f, but the prover still will not know anything about f. Um, the key observation, really, is that the right-hand side looks an awful lot like the inner parentheses of the left-hand side. So I can actually, uh, be, be, because we didn't really need any uh, structure out of our public parameter C, we can just treat C sub f now as our new C and just keep com computing on the right-hand side as if it were the inner left-hand side. Uh, so when we want to update... Uh, the commitment to uh, C sub f to G composed with f, we just keep uh, computing on that right-hand side, and uh, we'll get this verification equation that looks a bit like this, where uh, we have G, uh, sorry, we have C sub uh, G com composed with, with, with f uh, and on the bottom there, and then when we want to update openings, uh, we can just send the updated opening uh, to the verifier uh, of S sub G and F of X, but uh, if you want to update all the way from the original left-hand side, we do need that, that, that first matrix S. Um, okay, so how can we efficiently uh, specialize this uh, con construction? If you recall, most of the efficient, or rather most of the useful special cases were linearizable functions, so we're going to start thinking about uh, point, point functions and how to uh, use our efficient linear updates to, <coughs> to efficiently uh, specialize. So the point function that I'm going to be uh, talking about for the rest of this talk uh, looks like this uh, on, the t on the top of the slide, where you have a hard-coded x, x bar and your output 1 if your input is equal to x bar and your output 0 other, uh, otherwise. 
Uh, right, so we have some function f for mapping from a domain x to a range y, and we're going to define the support of, of f as all of the inputs in the domain that map to some non-trivial output. Uh, so we can write f as a linear function of its support, uh, where um, we have these point, point functions uh, that only de de depend on the support, and then we have this vector of outputs uh, on the non-trivial non points. And the observation here really is that uh, because, or rather, like now we have this, this nice st structure where the uh, point functions are independent of the function itself, they only depend on the support. And this vector of outputs is independent of the input. So when we want to commit to a function with this structure, uh, all of the commitments to these point functions can be pre-computed. And the openings to, to uh, particular x can be pre-computed as well. And so for all of the uh, special cases that I'll list in the next slide, uh, all of the commitment and opening uh, operations will be linear, linear functions. And also, uh, all of these uh, specializations will in, in, inherit the uh, stateless composability. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is a highly versatile framework. I'll just leave this at the top there, but you can get vector commitments uh, just by treating um, the vector as a function that maps uh, indices to outputs in the, in the vector space. You can get an accumulator by taking your, your set S that uh, you committed to in your large universe and defining some function that maps elements in the universe to bits that indicate membership. But note that like, you don't need to sum up over all of the elements in the universe, you only need to sum up the, uh, the elements that are actually uh, in the committed set. Same thing for key, key value commitments. Um, mapping from keys K to values V just turns into this function and then you only need to sum up over the, the, the uh, defined keys. And then finally, you can get polynomial commitments through a very similar type of structure, but instead of using these point, point functions, um, you just use the uh, power, power, power function. And then the linear function is just with the uh, coefficients of the um, polynomial. All right, uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Any, any questions? Uh, nice talk, Leo. Uh, I have one question. So um, can you comment on what are the steps that are needed if you want to apply this new construction of yours to the um, applications of function commitment that you mentioned in the slides? Uh, yeah, so it would definitely depend on the type of application that you're talking about. Um, so yeah, I mean, for the vector commitment, say, uh, yeah, you would just uh, define your function as like, Right, so I can go back to that slide. So yeah, I mean, if you wanted to uh, have a statelessly up, uh, uh, updatable vector commitment, say, where like, um, you know, you have the verifier hold some commitment to a vector, and then I want to like aggregate uh, updates to this vector from lots of different parties. None of the parties that I'm aggregating from need to know anything about the vector commitment. They just need to know the index they want to update and maybe the like delta of uh, the entry. So yeah, this could be, um, this could be a nice application. I suppose. Maybe I didn't really understand your question. Yeah, then that makes sense. So I have a quick follow-up. Sure. So uh, when you apply the linearity and um, um, with the summation of two functions or multiple functions, so how do you handle the situation where the, the norm of the, the opening will grow uh, if you add together? Yeah, yeah, so definitely your modulus needs to account for that, for that growth. Um, in that sense, you can think of this as like sub supporting leveled, leveled updates. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I have two related questions. Uh, first one is, uh, what is the complexity of s computing CF? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'll go back to that slide because there's no real, but um, you can think of it as just running the arithmetic circuit of F. So there's like, uh, in the paper we go over this, but there's kind of um, analogous operations. Uh, so for each gate of the arithmetic circuit, uh, you have some matrix operation that you use to uh, compute C sub F, and then yeah, you, you're essentially mm -hmm. just running through uh, the arithmetic circuit of F. Yeah. Okay, and can we say that the the stateless update that you mentioned, since we like reset C with C F, mm -hmm. does it have the same complexity as computing C F, or it's much less? 
Uh, so if you already know C sub f, you don't have to recom recom recompute it. Um, the size of C sub f will just, like, it will have to handle the input to uh, g, I suppose. But really, yeah, you just start with C sub f and you just can continue your arithmetic circuit on uh, g. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the status update is just the, like, would be comparable to computing g in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. For the prover. The verifier only ever needs to do yeah, the, yeah. the linear check, okay. for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Hello, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I just had a question about vector commitments. Sure. Uh, so does your framework allow to open at multiple positions or functions of multiple positions at once? Yeah, so yes, although it's not like a sub-vector co vector commitment in the sense of like the efficiency re 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 requirements are not really like, you're, you're just gonna grow with, with the, the, the number of uh, indices that uh, you want to open to. Although you can do the stateless uh, com composability very naturally where like, you know, if you don't want to open to the uh, actual vector element, you just wanna open to like say the bit parity of the vector element. You can easily update your uh, vector commitment to one that just opens to like the, the bit parity of that vector and um, yeah, the, uh, the verification is always the same. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. So we now have a, a track uh, switching break, and so we come back in 10 minutes for the continuation of the fully encryption session.